Och ändå olika är ett projekt som finansierad av Allmänna Asfonden, Vikho kommun och Länsstyrelse. Projektet har en projektgrupp bakom sig som hjälper i det här projektet i olika moment. Projekt Lika och Olika har för syfte att utbilda 20 kulturambassadörer, unga invandrare tjejer mellan 14 och 25. Flickorna skulle kunna leva i Sverige och känna balans mellan sin egen kultur och den svenska kulturen. Vi jobbar med det här projektet med olika små projekt samtidigt, alltså parallellt. Vi gör så här att vi får syfte det att hjälpa de här flickorna att leva i en annan kultur som skiljer sig än sin egen kultur. Då gör vi för att lyfta fram den här familjen som helhet. Momenterna är. Den första är att vi föreläser och benjordbildningar för att få människorna från den kulturen som, som är konservativ att, som kommer till Sverige att känna uh, att det inte är farligt att integrera sig. Att det inte är så att man smälter in eller förlorar sin egen kultur utan man ska hitta balansen. Och, uh, de uh, här flickorna. Syftet är att de ska utbildas till att kunna sin egen kultur och den svenska kulturen för att kunna prata och tala om hur de vill leva i Sverige och hur är det att vara integrerad. Vi brukar säga att det går att vara en muslim och en svensk. Alltså. Och det här är inte riktat bara för muslimerna utan alla invandrare flickor som har bakgrund alltså, i en annan kultur som kan skilja sig från den svenska kulturen. Det är den momenten och det är syftet att flickorna skulle resa runt och berätta hur de vill leva. Därför kallas för kulturambassadörer. Den andra delen av projektet är det mötsplats där vi kan de här tjejerna träffas och ha roligt och samtidigt lära sig. Och det är tjejkafén som vi har på eh, alltså, eh, kultur, eh, alltså ett mötsplats där vi har det nu i Arabiskolan. Den platsen kan vi alltså, spela teater, dansa utöva radioprogrammet som det är den tredje momenten. Där i den här tjejkafé, de kan titta på en film, diskutera det. Vi bara hjälper de här tjejerna att tänka efter och öppna deras ögon för att se vad de har för rättighet och skyldighet. Hur kan de balansera mellan sin egen kultur och den svenska kulturen. Och genom de här tjejerna, vi brukar säga, berätta för era föräldrar vad vi pratar om. Det är genom dem vi ska nå föräldrarna också. Så vi tror att de här tjejerna kommer att eh, tala om hur de vill leva och att de ska utvecklas till alltså, utveckla sin identitet positiv. I en, det behöver inte vara negativt som många kan uppleva att leva i två kulturer. Utan vi lever i mångkulturer samhälle. Vi måste öppna vår tanke och acceptera alltså, andra. Och acceptera att det inte bara är ett matstock eller det fungerar på det sättet och inget annat sätt alls. Den tredje momenten det är en radioprogram. I det här radioprogrammet får tjejerna tala om hur de lever i Sverige. De talar om hur det är det om, alltså, i, i olika artiklar eller, eller olika diskussioner om hur det är det att leva i två kulturer. Och vi pratar om uppfostran. Vi pratar om uh, momenten när det är svårt och när det är lätt, när det är roligt och när det är uh, jobbigt. Uh, vi pratar om vilja läsa dikt, vi uh, har sånger, vi, vi försöker få dem att känna att det här kanalen eller den här momenten är för dem för att, för att uttrycka sig. Och de får slappna av och säga att ah, det här vill jag att det ska vara med och så här. Och sen kännas ansvar. Uh, den tredje uh, eller Ja, det är det momenten då att vi har också en eh, ak andra aktivitet eh, som är en, en uppsatsstävling som nu körs i skolor, eh, nyorna och eh, gymnasium där eh, får studenterna, eh, både pojkar och flickor, skriva en uppsats om 
uh, att leva i två kulturer och där de får alltså, de finaste uppsatsen och det behöver inte vara fin svenska utan bara berättelser som räknas att leva i två kulturer. De duktigaste uppsatserna, duktigaste som skrev, de får pris och de berättelserna som vi tycker är bra ska komma i en bok och det hjälpas vi åt med skolan och med eh, Rotaryklubben som är eh, delvis en del av dem är med i projektgruppen och Rädda barnen också eh, alltså ligger bakom och jobbar eh, för, för att utveckla eh, den här eh, tanken bakom projektet i att lyfta fram de här unga flickor. Um, sen har vi andra aktivitetsdel. Hela föreningen, Arabisk talande kvinnoförening, deltar. Och det är eh, att vi träffas en gång i månaden och har fest eller firar vår kultur. Vi kan ha någon gäst som berättar av samhället om hur det är det att leva eh, i, i Sverige. Man berättar om eh, något socialt eller politiskt så de gör dem medvetna om det eller livet eller kulturen de lever i. Och sen har vi eh, en fasta tid där till exempel att vi går till simhallen eh, en gång i, i vecka på lördagar där vi simmar ba, barn och kvinnor. Så då får möjlighet att gå ut och, och göra något roligt och samtidigt träna och må både psykisk och, och fysisk bättre. Och sen har vi gymnastik för samma syfte på torsdagar där vi kan också ha kvinnor och, och deras barn och de här tjejerna i projektet alltid med för att de skulle känna alltså, att, det här, att det här projektet är egentligen för hela familjen och för att de ska må bättre och lyfta fram hela familjen. Och det är för integrationssyfte. Alltså, för syfte är att, att få den här familjen att nästan problematiskt fri komma in i samhället och att det går att integreras. Man behöver inte förlora sin, sin egen kultur eller sin egen identitet för att vara med i, i svenska samhället. Den, den momenten som, vi har, som har gått och som alla har jobbat för det för projektet i gruppen och för äh, tjejerna som är med i, i, i tjejkaféet, det är konferensen som ägde rum den 13 november och det var på mat och drick i Vikho. Där hade vi gjort ett fantastiskt arbete där vi hade tre föreläsare där de berättar från olika alltså erfarenheter en som heter Rasul Aula som berättade om hur det är att leva mellan en kurdisk kultur och svensk kultur och vad är det som skiljer sig och vad är det som kan man mötas i och, 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 vad, och hur viktigt det här är med mötet och sen pratade Maria Högberg också om problematiken och hur det är med det hedersrelaterad våld och sen hade vi en gäst från Palestina och eh, Basma Abouswai kom från Palestina för att vi ska hon berätta om sin erfarenhet att jobba i socialministeriet i Ramallah där hon jobbar med att skydda barn och barn här är pojkar och flickor men alltså flickor som uh, blir äldre och kvinnor som har alltså för att få dem alla uh, stödja dem för att fortsätta ett bättre liv om de var för tryckta. Och de här tjejerna som utsatts för våld, det är man själva, de har något som alltså, skyddat hem för att hjälpa eh, flickor att, och ofta inte bara flickor alltså, och gifta utan kvinnor som gifta med sina barn. De kan vara där för att de ska rehabiliteras på något och så för att komma in i samhället och få få känna självförtroende igen när de var förtryckta länge eller när de var utsatta för våld och då får de alltså ett jobb. Hon också kommer att berätta och det börjar vi med henne i den här tre möten som vi ska ha på öppna kanalen. Först är det Basma Abouswai, sen är det Rasul, sen Maria Högberg och det, det vill inte glömma de här flickorna tjejkaféet där de har deltagit i början av konferensen med en teater där de kunde problematisera, alltså sätta problemet i fokus genom teater och det var de kommer att sändas också och visa det på ett roligt sätt samtidigt ge en budskap vad är det vi försöker flickorna att vara medvetna om och samtidigt hur ska vi gå ur den här problematiken? Det kommer vi kanske i sista momentet att prata om. Uh, my name is Basma Abswai. I'm from Palestine. 
Uh, I work at uh, the Ministry of Social Affairs in Ramallah uh, as a Director General for Family and, uh, and Childhood. Uh, and first of all, I would like to say that I am honored actually to be here <laughs> with you today. And I would like to thank my friend Dalal Abdel Ghani for inviting me and for giving me this uh, opportunity to be here and to share with all of you our experience uh, in Palestine in dealing with uh, domestic violence and uh, family violence. And uh, actually, this morning, I, I tried to understand some of the presentations. Some of the ladies here tried to translate to me. It was not easy. And I would like to apologize for those of you who get uh, disturbed from the translation, because Dalal was trying to translate to me. And I, I know that disturbed some of you. So I'm sorry, but I felt like I understand nothing of what's going on here. Uh, so, uh, I would like to tell you maybe a little bit about my bi background. Uh, I studied at Birzeit University, University, which is a Palestinian university in Birzeit town near Ramallah. Uh, my BA is in sociology. After that, I went to the United States of America, where I have my master's degree in uh, rural community development. Uh, after that, I went back to Palestine, and I worked in many uh, national and international organizations, uh, such as Birzeit University. I worked with UNDB, with UNICEF, with WHO, and finally with the Ministry of Social Affairs. Most of my experience related to women and child protection, and some of it were in environmental protection also. I don't know, would you like to translate now? Or? Hon berättar att hon jobbar på Mekar Center via socialdepartementet i Ramallah och att hon jobbar med familjevåld i Palestina. Hon är väldigt tacksam för inbjudan hit. Hon ber om ursäkt om hennes översättningen från de tidigare inläggen här under dagen. Jag har stört de övriga men hon vill gärna följa med i hur debatten går. Hon har en bakgrund. Hon är sociolog från universitetet i Ramallah. Sen har hon vidareutbildat sig i USA med koncentration och mastersutbildning på utvecklingsarbetet på landsbygden. Kan man väl kort översätta det till? Och att hon har jobbat för olika FN-organ under åren och både med kvinnors och barns rättigheter och livsvillkor och miljöfrågor, om jag förstod det rätt. Tack. Um. If, and I would like to add, I'm, I'm trying to use the new technology here, but the new technology were supposed to help us, but sometimes it, it's not. <laughs> I don't know, I lost uh, part of my presentation, which I prepared to be with beautiful colors in the PowerPoint, and I used different colors, so I lost the red colors, maybe because it's the color of love, and we are not supposed to, to be in love. <laughs> so. But I will try the part that I still have in the PowerPoint. I'll present it with the help of the PowerPoint. The other parts I will just uh, present it to, to you uh, from my papers here. Um, uh, this morning, I really enjoyed the presentation of uh, Mr. Uh, what is uh, Rasul, and I like the way he tried to make this comparison between different cultures and. Uh, Actually, he did a very good, good job in this uh, comparison. But uh, I enjoyed it also because I felt when you live uh, in a mixed culture, when you have people from different cultures living together, it's like giving you a broad approach into looking at your own culture or at your own problems, at, at your own uh, social life with its advantages and disadvantages disadvantages, because when you are in a close society, it's not easy to see the others. Hon refererar till förmiddagens föreläsning där hon tyckte att Rasul gjorde ett, ett, ett bra framträdande och att man har väldigt olika villkor när man har olika kulturbakgrund i ett öppet samhälle än när man bor i ett slutet samhälle, och att det är en utmaning. Men att det finns många fördelar med att ta tillvara de här olika kulturbakgrunderna. Tack. Okay.
that's very quick. <laughs> Shorter in Swedish. Okay. Uh, today I will present to you the uh, family violence in Palestine and ways to eliminate it. And here I mean our efforts uh, as the Ministry of Social Affairs trying uh, to eliminate uh, family violence. And first I would like to, to start with saying that uh, family violence and domestic violence, it is an international phenomenon. It's not only an Arabic or a Palestinian or Islamic phenomenon. It's actually an international phenomenon. Uh, despite of uh, a cultural, economical development, it is there in all the societies, in all the countries. Maybe it has different forms or different uh, levels of it. So it is, uh, I think it is an international phenomenon. And it depends on uh, the international system of power and control and exploitation, which means that the powerful always control the vulnerable groups. And that's why we experience all kinds of violence. It's not only family violence, even the international violence, the violence against small societies or violence against the poor. So it's, I think, I believe it's based on the international system of power and control. Okay. Uh, for example, I'm, I hear I have an example like one third of the American women were exposed to physical and sexual abuse by a family member, a relative, or a friend. So I give this example only to show you it's not really related only to religion, nor to development or to economic development. It's there. It's everywhere. Uh, about family and domestic violence in Palestine, maybe most of you knows that Palestine lives under occupation. We live under Israeli occupation. And this means, and this affects all aspects of our life, social, economic, culture, uh, all aspects of our life is really affected by this occupation. And the most evident kind of violence that the Palestinian community in general, including women, children, men, elderly, uh, special groups, everybody is really facing and experiencing the occupation violence. This violence is illustrated in the killing, injuries, arrests, confiscation of freedom, siege, closure, etc. We face all kinds of violence. Yani, saying that, I'm, try I'm not trying to hide the social or the domestic violence. We also, as a society, as all other societies, we face, we face domestic violence. But this occupation and the policy of the occupation, it affects all of us. It affects our social psychology, and this affects our community relationships with each other. It affects the relationship within the family uh, itself, because this policy, it leads to the increase of poverty, increase of unemployment levels, the loss of feeling of security, and the loss of a family member, most of the time the father, the mother. So all these things, it put high pressure on the family and it leads to increasing the level of violence inside the society. Should I stop? Yes. I think many people who read understand what it means, but I agree with you. I can't really put myself in this situation. Det här framträdandet, men det är väldigt uppenbart att ett väldigt våldspräglat samhälle som Palestina är på grund av ockupationen, där påverkas alla människor väldigt starkt av våldet och att det påverkar naturligtvis också våldet som förekommer i familjen och att familj, våld i familjen det är ett internationellt problem och att maktsystemen i ett land påverkar kontrollen över även den enskilda individen. I sitt yttersta. Men att det gör att det är, det är svårt för alla möjliga trakasserier av Palestinas invånare sker i ockupationens namn, som vi vet med vägspärrar och annat. Och att det är en omöjlig situation att leva under som får effekter ända in i familjen. Okay, now I will talk about the domestic violence in the Palestinian community in general and inside the, the family in particular. Uh, and uh, according to a domestic uh, survey, which was done by the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics uh, in June 2006, 
they studied uh, domestic uh, violence, uh, including physical, psychological, and sexual violence. And they found that the, this kind of violence is really increasing in the Palestinian society. And I would like here to just give a note that the Statistical Bureau of Statistics, they based on an international definition of violence, and they used uh, international standards and uh, variables in measuring violence in Palestine, which is really, sometimes it's not really very, um, it's not a clear indicator, or, or it's not a true indicator of violence. Because what it is violence, for example, in Sweden, it might not be violence in Palestine. It's not taking into account, really, the cultural context. Uh, so we need to take into consideration, even when we talk about these numbers, that because the variables that was used, it's an international standard, so it might not really means uh, or gives a true picture of the violence in Palestine. Uh, anyway, the statistics indicate that 61.7% of ever married women were exposed to psychological violence. 23.3% exposed to physical violence and 10.9% exposed to sexual violence at least once by their husband during a year. 52% of unmarried women, 18 years and more, were exposed to psychological violence, and 25% ex exposed to physical violence at least once by the family members during the year. And according to the Palestinian Commission for Human Rights, uh, in their report in December 2007, and due to the absence of the rule of the law and the spread of vigilant justice, there was an increase in the reported number of women killed due to family-related violence. Like, there's 37 women were killed in 2007. 17 of them do the so-called family honor, which uh, I, I found that it seems it's a very hot topic here and everybody is talking about it. So 17 of the women were killed based on the family honor. Nine of them do to family conflicts. 11 of them do to misuse of weapons and other incidents within the community. And moving from women to children, 52.2% uh, of the Palestinian community are children under the age of 18 years of old. More than half of these children were exposed to one kind or another of, uh, of abuse or of violence by a family member. Would you okay. Jag hann inte skriva upp alla siffrorna här, men... Uh, hon presenterar här en rapport från Statistiska byrån från 2006, om jag uppfattade det rätt. 2006. Och att den visar att våldet ökar i Palestina. Men man har utgått i den statistiska rapporten från en internationell definition och standard som inte alltid ger en trovärdig rapportering utifrån den kulturella aspekten, för den saknas, menar hon. Hon har berättat att det är en väldigt hög siffra när det gäller våld, våld i samhället överhuvudtaget, men också våld mot kvinnor specifikt. Att det både handlar om, men framförallt om psykisk misshandel, men även av ganska omfattande fysisk misshandel. En fjärdedel av kvinnorna i Palestina och en 10 procent drygt av kvinnorna utsätts även för sexuellt våld i nära relationer. Och sedan pratar hon även om ogifta kvinnor, att det är en väldigt hög siffra där. Det är också 52 procent som utsätts för psykisk misshandel och 25 procent ungefär av fysisk misshandel. Att hon också rapporterar av 37 kvinnor så är 17 fall relaterade till familjens heder. Medan det andra är då i övriga. Det var andra familjekonflikter och de sista missade jag tyvärr. Men det, hon visar också på en väldigt hög frekvens av barnmisshandel. Fysisk och psykisk över 50 procent. Vilket bekräftar att det har en koppling. 
Okay. Uh, based on all the information that I gave to you, the numbers, the statistics, uh, and uh, based of the international, the increased international interest of human rights issues in general, and on the child rights and the elimination of all forms of violence against women, which the Palestinian Authority committed itself to all these conventions. So, based on all this and based on the legal mandate that was given to the Ministry of Social Affairs in general, in, as it is responsible for social protection in general and protection of the vulnerable groups, women, children, elderly, ch people of special needs, the poor, the Ministry of Social Affairs, according to the law, is responsible in providing social protection for all these groups. So for that, the ministry, part of its work is to lead the policy development efforts on the national levels in the framework of partnership with governmental and non-governmental organizations. Maybe, Yanni, you know that the Palestinian Authority is still a very new authority because we've been for a long time, for more than 60 years, under occupation. And now what we have is not a state, it's more an authority. Uh, this authority is started to build the Palestinian institutions and to build, to, to build our policies and laws. But still, we do not have really a functioning laws. The laws that is existing mostly are very old laws. We have laws from the time of the uh, British mandate. It's still functioning there. We have laws from the Jordanians, like uh, we have the, the criminal law. It's like 1953 law. It's a Jordanian law. And in Gaza Strip, we have the Egyptian laws, which also very old law. So these countries like Egypt and Jordan, they really updated and developed their laws. But we, because it's not our laws, we can't update these laws. We worked on developing, now we have what we call them pro laws projects. These laws are submitted to the Palestinian Legislative Council to discuss it, and after that, it will be approved and functioning. But unfortunately, because now, the Palestinian Legislative Council is not really functioning because some of the political problems inside Palestine. So we're still using and basing on the old laws. So to overcome this problem, what we are trying to do is to develop some policies and some uh, systems and what we call them uh, organizational uh, structures and charts to help us really deal with our uh, daily problems and our work. So this is part of the work of the Ministry of Social Affairs. Uh, and especially based on the practical experience, the field experience of the Ministry of Social Affairs for more than 12 years now in the field, uh, working with all kinds of uh, uh, social problems, we found that there is a lack of a systematic um, regulations in the field which help us in protecting the vulnerable groups, protecting abused women, protecting the, the children, especially we do not have a referral system where everybody, governmental and non-governmental organizations, can work together. Uh, for that, the Minister of uh, Social Affairs, we tried for the past, uh, we started like uh, five years ago, trying to develop our models. And here I will present to you two models, which I uh, supervise as the Director General for Family and Childhood. Uh, the first model uh, will talk about the Child Protection Network, which is related to child protection from all kinds of violence. And the second model is related to protection, protecting women. It's called Mehwar Center. And Mehwar, it's like the abbreviation of uh, uh, the name in Arabic, which means uh, the uh, Center for the Protection and Empowerment of Women and Families. I'll start with the first project, which is child protection. Vi får se om vi har fått med allt. Det är lite sammanfattning, men det var det jag skulle göra. Den här internationella rapporten den, den visade på att det är ett behov i Palestina av att särskilt värta barns och kvinnors rättigheter. Att socialdepartementet har det yttersta ansvaret för sårbara grupper, som de kallar dem. Och att det är särskilt angeläget att komma igång med, med olika insatser för att motverka våldet. Och att... 
det finns myndigheter idag som eh, har sitt arbete kopplat till fungerande lagar. Men problemet är att lagarna inte är i fas med tiden, så att säga. Va? Utan en del lever kvar från kolonisationen eh, från England och eh, även jordanska och egyptiska eh, lagar som lä- i de, sina eh, länder har eh, moderniserats men inte har moderniserats i Palestina ännu. Eh, och därför har man inrättat ett, eh, inrättat ett slags lagprojekt för att modernisera lagarna. Men däremot så är det inte helt enkelt för att det finns en del politiska problem som försvårar detta. Utan man har valt att försöka med en överbryggande modell som gör att man har utvecklingsarbetet genom organisationerna och där socialdepartementet har det övergripande ansvaret. Det man har sett helt tydligt och klart är att det saknas sociala trygghetssystem för speciellt kvinnor och barn i Palestina. Och att man har utvecklat två modeller för att hjälpa till i arbetet med detta. Och det är ett barnskyddsnätverk kan man väl kalla det. Och ett center som heter Meshwar Center som är ett center för skydd av kvinnor och familjer. Så. Okay, thank you. Uh, this uh, first uh, project, we, the Ministry of Social Affairs in cooperation and support of uh, UNICEF, uh, aimed at providing and development of protective environment of children in Palestine from all kinds of abuse, violence, exploitation and neglect uh, through the establishment of national child protection network and development of referral, monitoring and case management system. Uh, Uh, the target group, all children, and uh, according to this, any person under the age of 18 who is being abused, neglected, or violated in any way. Uh, and in developing uh, these networks, we, uh, based on the, the professional reference for the network, were the International Convention for the Rights of the Child and the Palestinian Child Law. And these two were identified as the professional framework for developing the, the system and the networks. Uh, and the, the, the methodology uh, we used, we, yani, we decided that we need a comprehensive system, a system that covers all sectors. Because when we talk about child protection, this means that we need the work of all sectors together, social, psychological, health, education, police, all sectors should work together to form a network where when you need to protect a child, you need to provide all these needed services. And also we said that this work, we need to do it in partnership with all organizations, governmental and non-governmental organizations, because no one organization by itself can provide protection for children. As I said, it is a, a multidisciplinary uh, approach. And in doing this, we, uh, we decided that we need to work in two levels. The first level is the decision-making uh, level. We called it the steering committee. And the decision-making level, we have the director generals from uh, all related ministries. We worked with five ministries, Minister of Social Affairs, Minister of Health, Minister of Education, uh, Minister of Justice, and the interior ministry represented by the police in addition to 10 NGOs, non-governmental organizations uh, working in the field. So we have the director generals of these institutions uh, forming uh, the steering committee. And the, the, the goal of the steering committee is to approve uh, the project idea and the, the developed referral system. And their role were, were first to select the, the second group, the second committee, which is the field committee, to select members of the field committee and they these were the child protection social workers in the field like people in working in the field from the different levels like from the health education etc people who have the experience of the field work who knows exactly what we need when we are talking about developing a referral system so we have uh, Yani, we work like we have the steering committee and we have the technical field committee. The steering committee chooses, selects the members of the technical committee and they review and uh, approve their work. And the work of the field committee was to, uh, to discuss, first of all, we tried to build the team. Because when we have people from different backgrounds, we had different language. 
that each one is talking in a different language. Even when we're talking about violence, each group is defining uh, violence or abuse in a different way. Even child, when we say a child, we have different uh, identification for child. For us, in the midst of social affairs, we consider any person under 18 years old is a child. For example, for the Ministry of Health, according to their regulation, a child is any person under 13. For the Ministry of Labor, it was people under 15. So we have different, uh, even like uh, definitions of a child. And uh, to all other terminologies that we were using, we had different languages and different terminology. So what we did in the beginning, we started with workshops we started first to unify the terminology that all of us are using to make sure that when we say a child, it's the same for everyone. When we talk about abuse, it's the same for everyone. So we worked on uh, identifying and unifying the terminology and in building the team spirit. Because when you have people from different backgrounds, there will be first like there was, for example, in the beginning, like mistrust between everybody because everyone coming from a different ministry, they feel it's our interest, it's our role, and we don't want someone else to take our role. And there was like, uh, sometimes it was like misconfidence that, for example, people coming from the non-government organizations, they were really afraid that the government will control them through this project. So we tried to build first the team spirit and everybody will accept the other and would listen to the other and would see how we can all work together. So we identified first the terminology. Second, uh, we agreed on the duties and responsibilities of each partner, where they meet and where each partner can work by uh, himself. So we tried to identify the roles, responsibilities between each partners. And at the end, we had a really wonderful team where people respect each other, they accept each other, and they accept the roles of each other. And they started to see how important it is to have this connection and this system in doing our work. So in my work as, a, for example, child protection social worker, if I have a good contact with a teacher from the education, this will help me a lot in following a child. And the same thing if we're talking about a teacher, if she knows or he, where to refer this child, this will help a lot. <laughs> I'm talking too fast. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Please stop me when you feel I'm talking. <laughs> Man började med två modeller här när man såg att man behövde jobba vidare med de här frågorna och man utsåg en styrgrupp som var utvalda representanter från olika grupper, både myndighetspersoner och NGOs, alltså organisationer. Man började med att bygga team och bygga upp ett gemensamt språk att definiera vad man hade för skillnader i språket. Nu pratar de flesta arabiska antar jag, men att det handlar om helt andra språkaspekter. Att vi har med oss olika språk beroende på vad vi jobbar med. Och hitta det här gemensamma språket. Och man började ha workshops för att hitta just de här minsta gemensamma nämnarna och att ta bort misstron mot varann. Att hitta en teamkänsla och att hitta det, det som kan jobba tillsammans, som har gemensamma intressen, så att säga. Det var en väldigt stark rädsla från organisationerna från början, till exempel rädsla för myndigheternas kontroll eller statens kontroll. Och att nu upplever hon att man respekterar och accepterar varandra och det präglar hela arbetet. Till exempel benämner hon att hon själv som sociolog jobbar tillsammans med lärare för att titta specifikt på, på barns situation. Den andra gruppen man hade, som man också antar jag har jobbat ungefär likadant, men som har ett speciellt intresse och är viktig här, det är fältgruppen. Där man jobbar direkt med de som berörs av insatserna. Och deras uppgift är att diskutera och informera då, så att man kan få upp det på en beslutsnivå. Tack. Okay. Uh, here, I, I'm, I told you about this. This is the steering committee members. We have uh, Musa is the Minister of Social Affairs, and we have Minister of Justice, Ministry of Education, Minister of Labor, 
and Minister of Health. Uh, we have Onorwa. Uh, you are familiar with Onorwa, yeah? And uh, we have UNICEF. Uh, UNICEF, we work with them not only as uh, donors, but they all actually work with us as partners also. And uh, uh, who else we have? We have the NGOs, as I said, the non-governmental organizations. These are the members of the steering committee. And they are also the members, the members of the technical committee, but we have these people from a different level. It's people from uh, the working in the, in the field, in the practical life, from all uh, these institutions. Uh, actually, we started this project, this pilot project, in three areas, uh, one in Gaza Strip and one in Ramallah and one in Jenin. Maybe you don't know these areas. But I am mentioning that because uh, the members of the NGOs, they might differ. Because not all of the NGOs existing in all the areas. You might find an, NG an active NGO in Ramallah, but they do not work, for example, in Jenin, which is in the north uh, of the West Bank. So the members of the NGOs, they might differ from one area uh, to the other. Here I'm talking about the network tasks, what we are expecting from this network to do. Uh, this network will be coordinating between uh, the network partners and implementing uh, the agreed upon procedures. Uh, it will be receiving children who have been subject to or are at risk of abuse referred by any of the partners in the community. And I like to mention here, it's not only the partners who can refer a child. Any person in the community can refer a child to the network. Even a child himself or herself can come to the social worker or any member of the community of the partners and ask for help or for protection. And uh, this network also will be providing temporary emergency care and protection for abused children as required by the set intervention procedure. I will be talking later about the uh, intervention procedures that we developed together. Okay. And also the network will be providing legal protection for network personnel working in the field as well as professional supervisions. Um, in our community still people, because when we're talking about child protection, it's really we talk sometimes about very hot subjects. Like, for example, when we talk about sexually abused child. And it, this is really a very, very hot topic. And many times, yani, people refuse to talk about it. Even if they know that there is an abuse, a sexually abused child, they try to hide it, not to talk about it. And even if this reached the police, for example, the police uh, try to solve this problem in, in, yani, from under the table, let's say like in relationships, in contacts, in convincing the child, oh, it's OK, you can go ahead. And for example, if the abuser is the father, for example, sometimes the abuser is the father abusing his daughter, for example, his 12 years old, for example, daughter. And the daughter will go and ask for help. Most of the girls in this age, they ask the help from their teachers or the social worker in the school. They, they start to talk about it. And when they go to the police, sometimes the police try to solve the problem without making it reach like the social affairs. And sometimes when it reach to us, and a, so, a child protection social worker try to take an intervention to protect the child, for example, to, to move the child from the family, or to ask uh, for the arrest of the abuser, the father, the brother, uh, a friend, uh, this he might be. Um, no, he, he might be under danger because he might be yani, uh, abused by the members of the community because everybody will say, it's not your business. Yani, this girl, she's the daughter of this man, so it's his business. You don't have the right to interfere in the family affairs. Mm -hmm. So he might be sometimes, the social workers, they might be under danger. So this network, we agreed that part of its work is to provide legal protection for the social workers working in the field. Another example, for example, a doctor. If a doctor uh, examined the child and he or she found that this child is sexually abused or is beaten, physically abused. So according to this new referral system, he or she should uh, refer this case to the Ministry of Social Affairs and should inform the police. 
But in our community, still, this is not very much accepted. So this doctor, he might be, yani, be in danger. He might be beaten, or be, yani, they will do something against him in the community. That's why we need some kind of protection for the professionals working in the field to feel free and to feel empowered that they can take an action to protect a, a child. Uh, also from the task of the network is observing the performance of the professional teams to determine their training needs and advance the skills of those in partner organizations working in the field. Uh, because this is still a, a piloting project, it's still a new effort, so we still need to do a lot of work in capacity building, in training uh, all the staff working in the partner organizations to be really uh, in the level, uh, in a very good uh, professional standards in dealing uh, with children. For example, this year, 2008, we started in training the police members. Because police members, uh, they don't know exactly how to deal with an abused child. When, when an abused child referred to the police, they used just uh, to put him uh, in an interrogation room. Uh, starting to ask him a question as if he is criminal, he or she is criminal, and they don't know how to deal with these cases. Or sometimes they keep referring it from one to another. So if you have, for example, a sexually abused girl, they don't know what to do. So uh, each one keep calling for someone else, so she will be abused for 10 times until she can be helped, if at the end someone will help her. So what we are doing now, we started training uh, police members on First of all, what does it mean to be an abused child? What does it mean to be a sexually abused child or physically abused child? How, how, to, how to meet these children, how to talk to them? So we, and now we are convincing the police, working with them, that the police members, we should select members to be working with children and women, and they should be wearing their civil clothes, not their official clothes, especially when working with children. And they should not, any. Yani, there should be person, non personnel to work with the children. Not anyone should work with the children. They should know what does it mean to work with the abused children. It, it's the last one. Only part of the network is to organize, okay, to organize uh, educational and awareness campaigns, because we are working in very in new topics and still. Uh, child protection is not really very much known by the community, and the community is not very much aware about uh, child human rights. So, for example, parents sometimes feel it's their right to beat their child. They think this is the right way for raising a child. So, uh, many they might do it, or uh, any family members might feel it's their right to make their child drop school. So, we need to work on educational campaigns to really inform people what does it mean to, to respect our children's rights and to protect our children. Okay. Uh, först var det en bild på hur medlemsorganisationerna i stödgruppen eller styrgruppen såg ut och där var ju både uh, från socialdepartementet, polis, pol politiker, myndigheter men också uh, olika internationella organisationer, organisationer representerade uh, och uh, även uh, lokala eller eh, palestinska organisationer eh, och att man har upprättat sådana här styrgrupper på tre ställen om jag uppfattar det rätt, i Gaza, Ramalla och Jenin. Eh, uppgifterna för nätverket som sådant är att ta emot barn som är i riskzon, erbjuda hjälpskydd eh, och också ge eh, eh, lagligt skydd till eh, personalen ge personalen en handledning i svåra fall. Ofta när det handlar om sexuella övergrepp till exempel så, eller andra övergrepp i familjen så söker barnen inte hjälp i, först i familjen utan hos till exempel någon lärare eller så. Och polisen hanterar det på olika sätt och försöker hjälpa till att lösa familjeproblemet medan barnet kanske egentligen måste skyddas för det kan handla om ja, hot om dödshot i sitt yttersta, men även de som möter barnet då som upptäcker olika övergrepp eh, hotas. Därför har man inrättat ett lagligt skydd för personalen också. Eh, man arbetar också med utbildning och eh, utbildningsbehov både hos de involverade organisationerna men också sådana som man har samarbete med på olika sätt. Man eh, arbetar med kampanjer direkt till familjer och barn ute i samhället 
och man arbetar med utbildning för myndighetspersoner, till exempel polisen. Nu har man haft en utbildning om sexuella övergrepp och vad som händer med barnet för övergrepp och hur man ska hantera det, hur man ska prata med barnet. Rent alltså som metodutveckling för att kunna hantera det på ett rätt sätt och möta barnet. Man arbetar också för att sprida kunskap på olika sätt genom publikationer, media och annat för att visa på barnskydd och barns rättigheter som fortfarande är ganska okända i Palestina. Uh, okay, I, I'll move here to this uh, format, which just summarizes the, the referral system which was developed. My friend Dalal is telling me that I have only 10 minutes, and I have to say that I respect your commitment here, because if it is back in Ramallah, usually in conferences, after lunch, everybody leaves. Mm -hmm. And those who stay, only those who must stay, because they, the, it is their job. So I really, it's, this is the difference between cultures. Usually we keep lunch until the end, so people will stay there. <laughs> okay, the referral system that uh, we start with the, the child or the family member, uh, this child will be referred to any of these partner organizations that I mentioned that, and any one of these organizations that a child referred to, they refer, refer a child to the child protection social worker, and these work, these are the people working with the Ministry of Social Affairs, and the first task of the child protection social worker is to, to make assessment, to make sure that this child is abused and what kind of abuse, and then he will call, he or she will call for case conference. The case conference will invite members of the network, not all, always we need to invite everybody, only we invite those who, according to the case, if this case required a police member, we'll have a police member, a teacher, for example, a, a parent, and the child and the social. Not all the time we need to invite everybody. It's according to the assessment of the case. And after the case conference, we will start with the assessment, evaluation, referral, monitoring, medical care, psychological and social support, and supervision. This is to summarize the, the, the system we developed. I have to move quickly to Mehwar Center, which is uh, the Center for the Protection and Empowerment of Women and Families. And as, uh, and as I told you, because I have a red background, it's not really working. Um, and uh, for women, it's, it's really, uh, actually in our society, people accepted to work with women protection much easier than they accepted to work with children. Because according to our culture, we like to say always that we have very strong families and we have very strong social ties and our families, we really, uh, we have this social love relationship where we protect our children. So it's not easy to, see, to say to anybody that we are abusing our children. But actually, as any other society in the world, there are some cases of uh, child abuse in the families. But when it goes to women, because people, in, even in the world, they started to work with women is issues uh, longer, much longer before working with children issues. Yeah, anyway, for uh, in Palestine, after we started to realize to realize that there are many cases of abused uh, women, all kinds of abuse, and we were always facing the problem that we don't know where to refer this woman, especially when we have a woman with children or a girl, a young girl, because protecting is not only providing like social or psychological counseling or having a police protection or going to the to the judiciary system. Sometimes you need to provide a safe shelter for the women and children. And actually some of the NGOs started this effort of having these shelters, but uh, the Minister of Social Affairs in the year 2000, uh, we had the idea, it came from the field, from the social workers of the field, that there's a big need for having a shelter for women protection. And it's not only for protection, it's also for empowerment that the cases of abused women who comes to, to this shelter will, not, will also uh, be empowered. They will regain their self-esteem because when you are abused women, you, you lose your self-esteem. You start complaining yourself. You think it's my own problem. If I'm not did this or that, then nobody could abuse me. So they start complaining themselves and they lose confidence. So we start working with you know, making these women regain their self-esteem, their confidence, to trust us, to feel that they are in safe hands. 
and after that we start to put the plan of intervention, how we are going to work with these women. And actually for uh, this, I, unfortunately I had very beautiful pictures for this center, because I really feel proud of having, accomplishing this project. Uh, anyway, we started the Bethlehem municipality, donated a land in Bethlehem, because truly everybody started to realize we need it. So we have uh, the Bethlehem municipality donated the land, and we received a very generous uh, support from the Italian government uh, through the Italian cooperation in, in Palestine. We received a very generous uh, support. We so built a, a model center, which is, I think, it's the first of its kind in the Arab region and in the Middle East, according to our Italian friends, because even we are now uh, ahead of them. They were our teachers in this, but we are now ahead of them in, in the structure itself and in our achievements, in our work. And uh, after having the, the center, we've been working in, um, in parallel. So we developed a policies and regulations manual, and we is working with everybody in the field, with all women groups and women uh, NGOs, uh, in addition to the government, Minister of Social Affairs and Ministry of Women Affairs. We also work in the same way, trying to build a team trying to agree in the terminology, who's the abused woman, what kind of abuse that we're having in the community. And we have some research done by the Palestinian Bureau of Statistics. So we tried to build this system in this, uh, in this way. And uh, after we finished the, the policies manual, we started hiring people. We hired like 23 social workers. Um, uh, all of them are females. We have uh, social workers, psychologists, and what we call uh, home mothers. And these are the ones responsible for the women and children inside, uh, inside the home. Uh, in this uh, shelter, uh, actually, we, we had a very long discussion. Should it be an open center that everybody will know that this center is there, it's existing there, it's protecting uh, abused women, or should it be in a secret place where nobody know about it because it needs protection? <coughs> Actually, we had a very, very long discussion in many workshops, but at the end, we decided we need to have an open center. Because if it is cl closed, people will start th yani, thinking bad, negatively about the center. They will think maybe bad women are there. So we thought, no, it should be an open center. So what we did is we divided the activities in two kinds of activities. We have the shelter itself, where we work with abused women and their children. And we have the outside center, which is a community center. We work with the people of the community. We, have, we started to have workshops for people from the community around the center. We started inviting, for example, women from the community, talking to them, introducing them to the center, its goal, its tasks, what it's doing. And we started to make some campaigns related to human rights and to women's rights. Also, we had workshops with, for example, for the police. And we have workshops for the judges. It was very important to work with the judges. And we moved to the villages to, to talk to the people also about the center, its role and its objective, so everybody will accept this idea. I talked a lot, yeah. Okay. Do you want to continue? <laughs> yes, you can continue. No, it, we take it here. Mm. Uh, I will continue to tell you about Mechvar Center, which uh, is more concentrated on women's rights. And she also tells me that it's easier to protect women's rights than children's rights. Children's rights are still very controversial to talk about. Eh, att familjekänslan och familjetraditionen är oerhört starkt, att det är svårt att tala om övergrepp på barn inom familjen. Eh, det har varit lite lättare att eh, få igenom det här med att skydda kvinnorna. Eh, och man såg ganska eh, tidigt att det var ett stort behov av eh, att ha ett skydd för kvinnor och barn. Men man visste inte var de skulle ta vägen. Eh, Socialdepartementet inrättade då eh, en, det här centret eh, som innefattar både boende och behandling kan man säga. Man behandlar genom empowerment, självstärkande träning där man bygger upp självförtroendet och får tillit till de som jobbar där. 
Och att man sen efter man har gått igenom det här arbetar för en intervention för att kvinnorna ska kunna gå vidare i livet. Man har 23 anställda socialarbetare, alla kvinnor, men även psykologer och något som jag skulle jämföra som husmor som finns på boendet som är en fast punkt. Det här hemmet finns i Betlehem och man har fått ett bra ekonomiskt och även annat stöd från den italienska regeringen kring det här. Man har också fått stöd av kvinnokommittén och socialdepartementet och inrikesdepartementet. Man har utformat olika manualer, vad som gäller, vilket regelsystem som gäller. Man hade en lång diskussion om det skulle vara ett öppet eller ett skyddat boende. Man valde till slut att ha det som ett öppet boende för att om det hade varit skyddat så kunde det uppstå dåligt rykte. Vilket som ligger mycket i det här med kring tankarna kring heder och den delen. Så man valde i alla fall att ha det som ett öppet boende och bygga in skyddet ändå på något sätt. Man har i boendet då utsatta kvinnor och barn. Men man har också en utåtriktad verksamhet som man kallar för kommuncenter eller samhällscenter. Där man anordnar workshops både till allmänheten och professionella av olika slag. Polis och jurister och liknande. Och där man också utbildar kring kvinnors rättigheter och mänskliga rättigheter. Um, part of the services that the center providing, we had a big hall for community activities. Khalas? Okay. It's always like this when you are at the end. You are the last one to talk. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to, to summarize. Uh, actually, in maybe this giving you a very bright picture of what we are doing. Uh, but what I would like to say, it's still a pilot, and we are, we've been working in this children. We started Riyani, providing services for women for two years now. Okay, give me five minutes only. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, we have different kinds of uh, abused women. And what I would like to say, when a woman in Palestine decided to come and ask for help, it's usually after it reached to here, where she can't take it anymore. Because it's part of our culture and the way we are raised as a girl first and as a woman that you have to be patient. And you say, OK, this time. And you try to find excuses for your brother, for your father, and after that for your husband, and maybe later for your boss. And you, you keep all the time yani, being patient and not complaining or not asking for help. So when you decide to ask for help, when it reached levels that you can't stop anymore, you can't stand it anymore. So the cases that we had, we till now received uh, around 47 cases of all different kinds of abuse, physical, sexual, and uh, psychological abuse. The most difficult cases are ones related to sexual abuse because most of it is compound. Because when you are sexually abused, this means that it is sexual, it's physical, and it is psychological abuse. So the cases when they reach the center, they are really very complicated cases, very compound cases. So it, it needs much effort to really work with these, uh, with these women and with their children. Because the children, either they are also abused or they are indirectly affected of the abuse that their mother uh, is suffering. Uh, and uh, another thing, although we, you know, we have now a good support from the community uh, around the center, from uh, the leaders of the community. They have providing very good support to the center. I don't want to see Dalal, OK. Uh, <laughs> but still, we are facing many difficulties in dealing with the cases. When you have a sexually abused woman or girl, it's much more difficult when it is a girl, like an 18 years old girl or younger because the community will not accept it. And we have people from all levels putting pressure on us, putting pressure, for example, on the Minister of Social Affairs. Sometimes people reach the president, They're trying to put pressure that this is our girl, it shouldn't be there, and she belongs to us, and it's not your role to take our women or our children. And they try to use all kinds of traditional relationships to put pressure on the staff of the center. And sometimes we have people coming, trying to invade the center. But uh, we 
we are really having very, very good staff there, empowered staff. They received very good training in the beginning uh, in Palestine, Bethlehem, and we, they went to Italy, also to Rome, to take training. And they've been empowered while working with these cases, although it's very stressful, but they, get, they are really empowered day after day. So these women are working there are really very strong, and they believe in what they are doing, and they are defending the center. It's not easy, really, to work in these kind of cases, especially, as I said before, in the absence of the law. What we have is uh, uh, the absence of the law. And the Jordanian law, which is there, is really very weak. It's really very weak. And in the traditional society war, where social and traditional relations are much, much stronger than religion and than law. And here I want to emphasize it's not always religion. It's mostly traditions, not the religion. because. For the honor killing, for example, it's not only Muslims who kill their girls or women. Also Christians in Palestine, we have Christians. They also have honor killing. So it's more the tradition. It's more the power. It's more the control of the, the, the men of the side. They n really need to control. And uh, next, the, f the beginning of December, we are going to have a very big campaign. We are organizing a campaign. And one of the slogans that we are going to use is, Honor killing is not honorable. Thank you very much. En kort sammanfattning av avslutningen här det är att det fortfarande behövs, arbetet behöver utvecklas ytterligare. Att det är olika slags övergrepp man möter i arbetet, att det kan vara olika på nivåer och att kultur och uppfostran har en stark inverkan. Men till slut får den utsatta kvinnan nog. Som det ser ut nu har man tagit emot 47 fall av olika övergrepp. Och där hon betecknar att de sexuella övergreppen är svårast. För där finns oftast alla ingredienser med fysiskt, psykiskt och sexuellt övergrepp med. Barnen som bevittnar våldet är också utsatta. Och svårigheterna i att hantera det skiljer sig när det handlar om en flicka till exempel under 18 år och en kvinna. När det är en ung flicka så accepterar inte familjen och samhället det utan hon tillhör familjen och man gör allt för att få tillbaka henne till familjen och att det är väldigt traditionella påtryckningar och man kan ibland till och med invadera centret men man har väldigt välutbildad personal som trots, trots denna stress, stresssituation klarar av att hantera det på ett bra sätt som jag sa tidigare så har de också ett lagligt skydd kopplat till det här men hon ser också att det saknas fortfarande mycket inom lagstiftningen som man behöver rätta till. Att våldet är ett utfall av tradition och religion där huvuddelen ligger på tradition. Och att det förekommer inom alla religioner. Och att det är maktaspekten som är det gemensamma. Och man kommer nu att ha en kampanj som heter Hedersmordar, inte Hedervärt. Jai, 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 na'anna al-amar.